Good morning and welcome to River Valley Christian Church. What an amazing day. We've got some sprinkles from heaven today here in our local area. Um, so may not need to water the flowers, which is always, always a blessing. Um, just a few announcements. Let me just see here. It looks like um, in our brochure, Old Town Waverly Methodist Church, Saturday, September 28th at 5 p.m. We are all invited to um, a 1738 church service with a sermon by John Wesley. How amazing will that be? Um, that is September 28th at 5 p.m. That's a little bit off, so put that on your calendar. August 3rd um, at 6 p.m. at RVCC. Bring your family and friends to see The, the Blind. It's a great movie. And we're going to play that here August 3rd at 6 p.m. All are welcome. Uh, Friend Day is August 4th. And there will be a meal right after Friend Day. If you are able to contribute to that meal, contact Valerie Stowers at 765-341-1015 and tell her what size salads or desserts you can provide. If you can come to this, oh my goodness, it's an amazing meal. It is always an amazing meal, but Friend Day is a fun, fun time to come. If you've never been before, it's a great time to come in, into the church. And um, we now have the garden table set up um, in the foyer. So if you have extra veggies or you're looking for fresh veggies, you might find some on that table for free. Um, gift and tithe offering uh, can be done online. You can text to 765-200-6151 or you can mail a check to 5 R RVCC at 4295 Egbert Road, Martinsville, Indiana, 46151. Thank you for giving to River Valley and thank you for all that you do for River Valley and thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us today. Looks like we're just about to get started. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I missed you guys last night. We were there. Oh, were you? Yeah, we oh, were. I couldn't show you. All these people were there. I couldn't show you. I said, you think you're missing all the <laughs> room. Thank We saw Dennis now. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go.
Crucified on the cross as a criminal in the world's eyes. But Father, the eyes that have been opened up and enlightened, we know that he was not a criminal whatsoever. He was your lamb. To be the propitiation for the sins of mankind and all whosoever will might come to Jesus and allow him to be their Savior. He is the one. Father, this day we ask that you might hear our prayers, listen to our prayers, and that you might be blessed, Lord, by what you hear, by what you experience. And Father, we pray that your kingdom might be blessed by what we hear today from your word, that we might go from this place empowered by what we learn to win a world that desperately needs Jesus, to be light in a dark world, to be salt in a world that has no flavor. Lord, let it be so. Let it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's get to worship.
Sing a song or celebration, lift up a shout of praise for the bridegroom will come. The glorious one and all who look on his face will go.
morning, everybody. Good morning. So, came across this that I'm going to read to you on my Facebook page a couple weeks ago. Can't get it out of my head, so I'm going to share it. Starts like this. You are holding a cup of coffee when someone comes along and bumps into you or shakes your arm, making you spill your coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee? Anybody? Because you had coffee in your cup. Because you had coffee in your cup. (laughs) Not because somebody bumped your arm. Right? If you had tea in your cup, what would you spill? Tea. Tea, right? Grape juice, whatever. So whatever's in your cup is what's going to spill. So think about it this way. Whatever's inside of you is what's going to spill out as well. So when life comes along and shakes you, and it will, whatever's inside will come out. It's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So you have to ask yourself, what's in my cup? When life gets tough, what spills out of your cup? Is it joy? Is it gratefulness? Is it peace? Humility? Or is it anger, bitterness, harsh words and reactions? Life provides the cup. You choose how to fill it. So as I thought about this, I thought, wow, what did Jesus put in his cup? Mm. Right? What, when his arm got bumped and it spilled, what came out? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, love, grace, uh, humility, compassion. And I think about what did he do to fill his cup that way? He was filled with the Word of God. When he got bumped, the Word of God came out. Mm. So as we think about, here's our cup today. As you get ready to fill it, look inside and make sure there's room for Jesus. If there's not, dump that thing out. Rinse it really good. And as we come to him right now and we celebrate his death and resurrection, we celebrate the gift that was given. Let's go to him in in an attitude of repentance and, and ask for forgiveness. Ask him to fill our cup. Yes. Because his blood is what we want. Yes. His blood is what he gave. So let's be thankful. Let's ask for forgiveness. And as we go to him right now, let's remember his blood is for us. His body was for us because of love. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the decisions that were made. Thank you for your word that filled Jesus' cup so he could go to the cross for us. And he could die for us. And he could show us love. He could show us forgiveness and grace. Lord, we thank you for his body that was broken on the cross. We thank you for his blood that was shed. And as we remember now, we ask for your forgiveness for our sins. And this is all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
morning, it's time for the children to go to their teaching. Uh, they're going to have some singing at the outset of their kids' church time today. Uh, they're going to prepare today to come back next Sunday and sing for the adults on August 4th. While they're departing, why don't we all stand together? Would you greet someone around you and welcome them to River Valley? Uh, find uh, someone you don't know their name of and introduce their name. I don't know. Good morning, Good morning. 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 Good uh, some of you may have gotten a bulletin or you may have gotten a sermon uh, outline and uh, on the back of the outline there's some announcements of things we need to do together as a church family. Uh, one of the things every Lord's Day when you come there's a notebook in your row. Grab that notebook and uh, uh, it gives you a place there where you can sign your name and uh, leave your name and a phone number or an email address or some way that we can connect with you. Uh, we, we have almost every Sunday some guests. We'd love to know that you're worshiping with us today. Um, we, we appreciate everybody every week just putting place your name. And if any of you would have a prayer request, please uh, list that as well. Uh, on the screen you have this. I, I know it's small print up there. Some of you on the back side of the sermon outline have a list of things that we're doing in the very near future for outreach. Um, this Tuesday, uh, July 30th, the 55 and older are gathering at Los Patios in Mooresville, Mexican restaurant. Come join in, eat, uh, and enjoy the fellowship. We can all sit together. they got enough uh, space where we can sit together and, and enjoy company. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to show a movie called The Blind. It's the life story of Phil Robertson and the story of Duck Dynasty and how that uh, Christ changed Phil Robertson's life and how it then impacted the saving of his marriage and the raising of his children in faith of Christ. And then you know the story of Duck Dynasty and all the spinoffs that are even yet today. Uh, next Sunday is Spring Day. We want to invite people back to church. We want to invite people back to, from summer vacation and more. School's about to start. We'll be looking at Genesis 39 and, and seeing another story in the life of, uh, of Joseph. And then that following week, August 8th, Willie Robertson is putting on a national webinar. And he's going to be teaching about uh, creating a culture of evangelism and outreach in the local church. And uh, the key to a church is not that the preacher works to win everybody that comes in the door, but you and I work together to reach a neighbor that is yet in the building today and those in the neighborhood who aren't in the building today, that we make sure there is a welcome here and we create a culture where they can hear Christ, God speak to them, and they can walk and talk with God together with us. And that making of disciples one by one or family by family is what we want to do. And then uh, that will be followed up on August 11th with a guest speaker, uh, Jesse Pryor, a missionary to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we support him. He's going back shortly after that Sunday to Papua New Guinea to work with bush people. Uh, you fly into the big city and then he goes down the river on a canoe to get to his people that he and his parents for about 50 years have developed uh, into followers of Christ. And uh, they learned an alphabet, they made a language, they 
they translated the Bible into the language of the people, they established a church there in the community, they got a school in the community, they got a hospital in the community, and that has been spearheaded by Jesse's parents and Jesse and Carrie, and Carrie happens to be my niece. So we're excited that they will kind of end their time in Indiana and uh, in the U.S. before they go back with us here. So we've got a lot of good things. The focus is outreach. The, the fo focus is introducing somebody to Jesus that they might know him as Savior and follow him as Lord uh, every day of their life. And uh, we need to do that together as a church family. And I'll do my part and you do yours. And we'll make this a shining light in our community. Now, we are turning into the book of uh, uh, Genesis, chapters 37. And put your finger in 39 also. 37 and 39. I might say we had Wednesday night Bible study. We had a, a large group, a large uh, number of first-time uh, students for a long time in there, about 22, 24 people. Uh, we hope if you have Wednesday night available at 6.30, come join us. Um, Thursday morning, we had a good solid group of about 12 or 14, and uh, we'd love to have you either of those days. What we do is we preach on this subject matter today, and then we teach verse by verse on it on Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, it's amazing what we learn more about the life of Jesus. Today I want to talk about Joseph the dreamer and his dreams get hijacked. Um, in just a little bit, you're going to see how John's devotion at the Lord's table matches this story and application for today. I don't know what I'm doing. I hope we can move very little. <laughs> to keep that from distracting you and me. Oh, let's pray. Father, we don't know what's going on right now, but we you will really see. And may your word go out. Uh, thank you for the rain that's going on outside. We need that. Thank you for these people who came to hear your word. May you hear what you have helped me prepare that Joseph can teach us. In Jesus' name I pray and all his people say. Amen. Amen. Gary Richmond wrote a book, It's a Jungle Out There. And he wrote it uh, a lot after he went to a zoo. And on that trip to the zoo, he witnessed the birth of a giraffe. He happened to be at the, uh, the zoo just at the right moment to witness the strange and amazing interaction between the mother giraffe and the baby giraffe, a cat. He was standing at the time right next to the zookeeper, Jack Badal, and he had a lot of questions as he was watching the birth of this animal. What was most unusual is the mother giraffe was standing when she was giving birth. And the calf's hooves and the head were beginning to be visible. So Gary asked Jack, what, when is the mama going to lay down? And the zookeeper answered, she won't lay down. That's a 10-foot drop to the ground. Why doesn't she lay down? Or who is going to go catch that baby cat? The zookeeper said, you try catching it yourself. But if you don't, if you would, the mother would probably kick you because she's protecting her young. And soon the cat hurled forth from the womb, landed on his back with about an 8 to 10 foot drop. The infant giraffe lay there where it fell, almost motionless, for about a complete minute. And then something totally shocking happened. The mother kicked the baby giraffe. She booted the little one hard enough to send it sprawling head over hoofs. And uh, the, the Gary said, why did she do that? And the super keeper said, well, she wants it to get up. And somehow the newborn giraffe knew that in order to get up, he needed a little help from the mother. And after a few feeble tries, he would begin to just fall back down. But when the mother kicked him, it sent him sprawling, and it made him have to react quickly. 
Before too long, not only the first kick happened, boom, there was a second party kick. This time, after he was struggling, it completely knocked him and he rolled over, head over hoof again. This time, the calf began to prop himself up and literally began to stand on all four of those small stilts that God gave him. And he began to gather his wits. But would you know what happened again? This time the mother kicked the cat a third time, knocking him off his feet and back down again. But this time with the third kick, the calf got up quicker and got up sturdier. And then he got kicked a fourth time. And the zookeeper was asked, why is that mama kicking that cat? And the answer is, she wants that child, that calf, to remember how he got up. In the wild, if he doesn't get up quickly, a predator will pick him off. Got kicked. Have you got something in common with that baby giraffe? Have you ever gotten kicked by someone you love? Have you been kicked when you were down and just trying to get up? Have you been kicked by the very ones you expected kindness from and thought loved you? Genesis 37 is the story of Joseph, a 17-year-old boy, and he's getting the daylights kicked out of him. At 17 years of age, he, he looks good, he's healthy, he's strong, he's bright, but he's about to get kicked and kicked hard, and the ones that are kicking him is in his own family. Now, instead of being like the mother giraffe who kicks the baby for his own good, Joseph's brothers are about to kick him for no good at all. And Joseph's brothers are so ruthless that they are literally trying to hijack the dreams that he has for his life. And so these brothers are bumping him, kicking him, and trying to steal his dreams. I want you to see today some reasons why Joseph's brothers are kicking him. The spark is hatred. And the hatred is over a father's favoritism to one brother and not them all and a gift that was given to the one son, Joseph, that the others didn't receive. You probably know this story. If you have your Bibles, look at Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4. It says, Now Israel, who is also known as Jacob, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because they had been born to him in his old age. And he, Israel, or Jacob, made an ornate robe for him. Now, if you're reading the King James translation, it will literally say a coat of many colors. When his brother Saul, their father, loved him more than any of them, they hated Joseph and couldn't speak a kind word to him at all. Sibling rivalry. How do you feel when somebody in your family is the favorite? How do you feel when someone plays favorite with another? Teacher's pet. Co-worker getting favoritism. Some of you uh, know football season is on the horizon. And if you love the Colts, I found this old quote from Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning used to say, I don't play favorites, but I do throw the ball around. But there's an old rule, you throw the ball to the guy who gets open in practice. So he's going to go to a game and he's going to play favorites to the one who has worked hard in practice to help the team succeed. I don't know if that fits very well into this sermon. But uh, it does remind us that favoritism happens and there's some danger in playing favorites on a team or in a church or especially in the family. 
On the other hand, I can understand when favorites are played. Irma Bombeck once wrote this. Every mother has a favorite child, and it's always the same one. It's the one who needs you at the moment for whatever reason to cling to, or to hug, or to flatter, or to reverse charges, or to unload on. Ultimately, the favorite one is the one who needs you the most at the time they have the need. And so there are some times that it is very wise for a parent to play favorites with a child. But if you look at the text in 37 of Genesis, Job, uh, Jacob cherished Joseph in a way that he hadn't shown the other sons. And Joseph was hated by the brothers for the close relationship he had to the father. And to demonstrate the greater love he had for Joseph, Jacob made a robe of many colors. Now, how many of you have gone to church long enough? How many of you remember growing up in Sunday school and learning the story of Joseph and the Pope of many colors? You, you, you've heard this. So you know the principle. You know the foundation. But what's the big deal about a coat that is different than the one you got? It was mentioned briefly in a Bible study Wednesday night. But the tunics worn by working men in that day were mostly sleeveless and stopped at the knee. But a long sleeve tailored garment was worn by a manager, someone who had been put in charge and therefore was exempt from the work of those around him. Mm. And so the coat was a symbol of a position of authority and not equal with his peers. Joseph's brother saw him in that coat and it was a sign of their father's choice to make Joseph preeminent over them and he was hated because of that father's choice. What others of us can have Hatred is sparked by some action of those around us. We can have hatred or jealousy if we're not careful. Is there a co-worker that gets a raise or a promotion that you felt you deserve? Is there a teammate who's get raised to the prominent position of captain and you felt you should be? Is there a boy dating the girl you'd really like to ask how? Is there a girlfriend getting married and you're still single? Is there a person that every time you think of or you see just out walking about, your, your blood pressure just rises? Why do they have it so good and I have it so bad? <coughs> you see, if we're not careful, any of us can have hatred when life takes over, kicks come, situations arise, and we think somebody has it better than us. And Jacob's Favoritism and special gift to Joseph triggered his brother's hatred. What does it take to get so angry at a brother? Seems like all it was was a little gift. I want you to see another spark that triggered the brothers that made them want to do away with Joseph and uh, kick his dreams. It was the dreams he actually gave. If you read in Genesis 37 verses 5 to 11, Joseph shared with his brothers two dreams. Each dream had different symbols. The first dream was Joseph saying, hey, they're in an agricultural setting and they probably uh, uh, harvested some wheat and they set up sheaves together in stacks and Joseph's stack was in the center and it was standing tall but the twelve brothers had stacks of the harvest and they were not only laying down they were pointed and bowing to the center which was Joseph 
And the impression from the dream when he told that story to his brothers was, oh, we're going to be bowing down to you. And then he had a second dream. There was a, 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 a conglomeration of stars. And there was one in the center and the other 11 were surrounding him. And obviously lesser lights than the one in the center. And the implication was not only would the brothers be bowing down to him, they would give him preeminence and even uh, almost worship. The dreams drove the brothers crazy. The parents even asked, what is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to you uh, on the ground before you? And so the little brother tells this crazy set of dreams. When somebody tells you what they think is going to be in the future, you might poke fun of them or belittle them or ignore them. But the thought of these 11 brothers came up. Uh, uh, a worship or an allegiance or, or having some certitude to the one brother just drove them crazy. In fact, Genesis 37, 11 says his brothers were jealous of him. Have you ever been jealous of someone around you, maybe even in the family? There are several classic signs of a jealous person. You aren't happy about their success. You criticize, you gossip, you talk behind their back. You want to ruin the relationship with them. And you may even work to sabotage their future. Jealousy can drive you crazy. Joseph's brothers were jealous and it festered into an action that began to hijack Joseph's dreams. Quickly, the father's favoritism and Joseph's dreams even triggered the thought of Joseph, the calling the dreamer. It ignited an inferno of hatred and jealousy, and it created a conspiracy that was going to last for years that they had to cover. <laughs> Genesis 37, 24, uh, 12 and 24, Joseph was sent by his father to track down his brothers. They were shepherding the flock. In verses 18 to 20, the brothers see him coming. And you have to remember, there was a prior incident where Joseph went to see the brothers working with the sheep and he came back and gave a bad report. So he also was a tattletale on his other brothers. This time they see him coming and they conspire to even kill him. They say to one another, here comes this dreamer, verse 20, come now, let us kill him, let us throw him into the pit, then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. And so as Joseph approaches, he is wearing that special cloak, and that just raises the, the temperature and the pressure. And they go back to a dark deed, they throw him into a pit, hoping he will die from that experience. And then they decide to sell him into slavery. There are some Midianite traders in a caravan. They sell him for 20 shekels of silver. And they try to get him as far away from them as possible. And then the next part of the conspiracy is... They lie and deceive their father, pretending Joseph is dead. They gave their father the blood-stained coat of many colors, leaving Jacob to conclude the son is dead, and plunging Jacob into unconsolable grief, and it was total deception. Someone made this observation about jealous people. People rain on your parade because they're jealous of your son and tired of their shame. And so there's great animosity among the brothers that sent Joseph being kicked hard into Egypt. Now I'm going to close with three points here. There are some lessons from the pit and the kick that Joseph experienced. 
Number one, just because you know that what you might do could create animosity with those around you, you keep reaching for the star and the dream God has for you. The comedian Milton Berle, a few decades ago, wrote a poem, I'd rather be a could be if I can't be an R, because a could be is a maybe who is reaching for a star. Do you have some kind of dream? Do you have some kind of goal? And if so, are you bold enough to share that with some of your family and closest friends? I think God has a dream to use you and your life for your good and his kingdom good. Do you believe that? I believe God has a dream for you and your life and his good. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for you to prosper, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and give you a future. In God's eye, everyone that's in this room today, he has a vision of what you can be through Christ who will give you strength. You are God's could be, may you use that for his glory. Joseph became a pivotal character in the story of Israel, and God used Joseph to shape the destiny of Israel because he was a could be that needed to reach for a high star of leadership. Number two, that in our lives, with every dream you have, with every goal and vision you want to achieve, we got to realize that adversity will come. There are no world changers who achieve God's plan without adversity. In order to be useful to God, God might have to take us through some time of training and shave off rough edges and hone our attitudes and purpose. And some might call this training the school of hard knocks. When I graduated from Johnson Bible College, uh, now 46 years ago, I wanted to serve the Lord, not as a preacher, but as a youth minister. And I wanted to serve him, and I thought I would work with the church and try to help raise youth to follow Christ. And I would do that too, because I never had one growing up. I, I never was a part of a church that had a youth ministry. And so I wanted to do that for others and uh, went to my first church and was excited. It took a little time to get that first church because I was single. And they would say, uh, well, you've got a great resume, but we're a little bit fearful. You might come and marry one of our girls and carry them on. <laughs> uh, and I thought, well... Uh, that's not really the purpose for the youth ministry, but I can't say it won't happen. But I got turned down several times because I was just single. I, oh, we like somebody with experience. Well, got to give me a chance. Well, finally at church, when I interviewed, the preacher said, it doesn't matter if you're single, it doesn't matter if you have experience, we just need help. And I said, well, then I'm your God. I went to that church. And had a great experience for seven years, but it wasn't without adversity. Um, within a year and a half, the preacher invited and encouraged me to come, um, left the church. He, he, he really didn't even tell me he was resigning and moving on. And that created a little turmoil in the church. The transition wasn't done smoothly. And it uh, was a real challenge for me. I'm 22 years of age, and I'm thrust into more preaching than I ever wanted to do. And in that small community, there was more funerals in that first six, seven months of his absence. I started preaching funerals at the age of 22 and 23. And at the end of seven years, I had preached 54. Wow. I got a lot of training, never wanted to do that, but that's what I now think is a good ministry that I can share today. Next preacher came in, and there was just some kind of non-fit, and in 
six months, that preacher was gone. And I'm trying to do youth ministry and trying to make it succeed. And there's aspects of the youth ministry that are going. And then another six or nine months before the next preacher comes in. And then in three years, that preacher was gone. And I'm kind of holding my head. Oh my, can I, can I keep working? And at that point, I did start dating one of the girls from that church. Believe. And so I said, let's just kind of go slow and figure this out. And then when uh, Lee graduated from community college and needed to go to another college, I said, well, you know, I think it would be a good time for me now to move to Indianapolis. There's a job opening there. Let's do that together. And uh, the fourth preacher came in. I worked with him for about three months, and I told him as soon as I could, I just didn't think I should stay any longer. But you know, in that time, I grew I had to trust God. I, there were 23 different kids who went to Bible college from that church. Wow. There are three preachers out of that group and many friends that we stay in touch with. Some of you met uh, one of the youth leaders of that church. He, he eventually moved to Martinsville. His name was Doc Webb, and he was with us. And Doc used to always tell me, Kevin, you ought to pay us for the education you got in this church. <laughs> it wasn't terrible, but it was tough. I was forced to do more preaching, teaching, and just listening. And I only had a small role in the church, but I tried to make it get better. Today, the church is strong. They're going long. They're doing well. And it seemed like forever. It was seven years of my life. I wouldn't want to go through those seven years ever again. But I want you to know everything I learned that was hard, we put into this situation to try to make it better and to guard against some of the things that do happen when there is church ministry together. The story of Joseph is that God was with him despite the adversity. There's things that will come in your dream to be used and serve God that will shape you to the core. Do you realize that Joseph was 17 when his brother sold him into slavery? Do you realize he was 30 when... Pharaoh finally found the traits of good he had and raised him up to prepare for a, a, a famine. That meant he was in prison 13 years, slavery or prison 13 years. And then he had the work to lead the whole nation of Egypt for seven years, in, in the seven years of bounty before the seven years of famine come. And it's in that seven years of famine, somewhere in there, maybe the third, the fourth, or the fifth year, that Joseph's brothers come back to Egypt and need the help from the second in charge in Egypt, and it's none other than Joseph. Where is God in all that time of from 17 to 30 to 37 to maybe 42 when he finally gets to see his father again? Where is God? God is with him the whole way. And God is with you in all those hard times. And if you have a hard time right now, he is with you today. Look at Genesis 39 2. The Lord was with Joseph. He became a successful man. Look at Genesis 39 5. The Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. Genesis 39 21. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. 
While you're going through hard times in life, behind the scenes, God is there and is working for you still. I think the Apostle Paul felt that. He knew it wasn't easy to advance the gospel in his day, go from city to city, often be run out of town. Maybe that's why Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Folks, to keep the dream you have alive, realize adversity will come. But the most important number three is, remember God is with you. Joseph's dark pit moment, his time spent in prison, could have tested even the stylist's heart. But Joseph's faith and trust in God ended not in the bottom of the pit, but on the pinnacle of leadership where he was able to serve the nation of Egypt and also help the nation of Israel, which was his family. Some of the hardest lessons in life to learn is we've got to live and die believing God will see us through. Years ago, I heard this story. You, you may know a little bit of it. You may have seen the accounts of it. But a man over 60 was uh, nearing retirement, and he was offered $200,000 for a restaurant, motel, and service station business that he spent his whole life building up. He turned that $200,000 down because he loved the business, and he, he wasn't ready to retire yet, and, and he, he just wasn't ready to give up. But before too long, there was a need for a highway to go through, and the state ended up taking his building, and they bought the business, but at a much lower price than the other offer years before. So here he was at the age of 65, nearly broke, not able to live on much, but his social security. What was he going to do? He was going to do the one thing he had a talent to do. Fry chicken. And he would go to those who needed his knowledge. He would share his gift, his talent. He would take his special recipe. He kissed his wife goodbye and left in the battered car. And he took a pressure cooker and went to whoever would take his recipe. And he sold chicken after chicken after chicken. And years later, he became a multimillionaire. And do you know what his name is? Colonel Sanders. His was a story of adversity and a change of direction that he never expected. But with tenacity and perseverance and the right product, he was able to move forward with God's blessing. Now, what you may not know about Colonel Sanders is this. He was a godly man. And in the days that he lost his business, he made a, God, a vow to God, if I become successful, I will give 50% of my income to your work in the kingdom of God. He belonged to the non-instrumental churches of Christ. He became a constant giver of gifts and endowments to their colleges. He paid for tuitions and books for young men who wanted to become preachers. And he died, yes, a millionaire, but he died being known for his philanthropy as well. And Colonel Sanders proved that true wealth is not measured by what we have or what we do, but by who we serve and whose cause we try to advance. God isn't just concerned about you and me reaching our dreams. He wants us to reach our dreams and then through us reach others for his kingdom and his glory. And maybe you're in the midst of the pursuit of your dreams. I, I see Benjamin over here. Joseph's younger brother was named Benjamin. Don't let anybody hijack your dreams. Benjamin, I know you got dreams. Don't let anybody hijack. You're going to be tested along the life's way. Anybody else been tested along the life's way? Sure. But God is going to be with you. He's been with us. And I want you to know 
It's important that you remember he is with you. Would you stay with me right now? The end result of any of us who have a dream and want to be used to God or want to do well for his glory is we've got to trust God completely. Well, one of the things I heard in preparation for this sermon is uh, not only do we need to trust God, we need to make disciples, and to increase the making of disciples, we need to start praying for people around us personally. I, I don't know about you, but I have a number of friends from this community. Last weekend, uh, I had my 50th class reunion. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> but I got together with a lot of my classmates, and some of them I really hadn't seen for most of those 50 years. But they kind of pricked my heart that, boy, if they don't know the Lord, they're among those I want to know the Lord before their life ends. <coughs> Kyle Alderman says we need to pray more specifically for people we want to know the Lord. I, I want to challenge you in this outreach mode that we're in. Would you start praying by name for a person to come to the Lord? Let God work on them if you can't find words to speak or share. Kyle said, he said, I I have an elder in my church that uh, he, he, he prays for people individually. And he says, I pray for that individual that God would work on the heart of that individual like God worked on my heart for years. Some of you uh, probably have testimonies. You had a grandmother, you had a mother, you had some special friend, some Sunday school teacher who, who poured into you, but they also Pray for you. I think one of the things I have failed to do as a preacher is I haven't prayed specifically for you like I should to come to know the Lord. Now, I, I want us to right now with this spoken admonition, if you have a person in your mind, in your heart, that you know needs to know the Lord, would you pray for them right now? I'm, I'm just going to stop you have that person, would you pray for them specifically right now? And with that, would you trust God to draw, have him draw them to the Lord and his church and to become a disciple of Christ? Now, we might have to speak a few words. We might have to encourage them. We might need to offer them. We might need to teach them. We need to share the gospel with them. And if you don't know what the gospel is, it's all about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus that you can share? Uh, one of a virgin. We celebrate Christmas. At age 30, he was baptized to start a kingdom ministry. Lived three years of a sinless life, but was persecuted along the way, had his adversity. Uh, he did miracles, wonders, and signs, and uh, he became known as a great prophet. But we believe Son of God, Messiah, fulfilling scripture. We believe he's the Christ who went to the cross, died for our sins, our Savior, was buried, and the most important thing, was raised again to new life. Raised from the dead, Easter. And from Easter, we, we, we are taught in 40 days he ascended into heaven and said he was coming again. And if all that's true, that makes him Lord of all. And, and we just shared that much do you believe in Jesus? Upon hearing of Jesus, people said, what do I do? I think there are faith actions you do do because of what you believe. You repent of sin. You, you, 
you call on the name of the Lord and say, I'm sorry for sin. I need your mercy. You confess Christ. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So there's a need to speak the name of Jesus and say he's Lord and say he's Christ and say he's risen from the dead. He's the Son of God. He's coming in here. And there's a need, if you haven't, to also be buried in Christian baptism by immersion because you believe in Jesus. Jesus in the Great Commission of Mark 16 said, Go into all the world, preach this good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. I trust Jesus. You share that good news, if they believe, let them be baptized to be saved. The early church on the day of Pentecost preached the gospel. They said, what do we do? We can't be baptized. 3,000 said, I accept your message. And we're baptized. I don't know if there's someone here today who feels the need to be baptized. We can arrange that if you do that. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithfully through hard times in life. I was baptized at age 11. I went to Bible college. I wanted to have a peaceful life for ministry. The first seven years were <laughs> terribly hard. But I benefited from that, and I share with you today, God can take you out of a pit for something. Trust God. He's with you. He's knocking on your heart even today. Would you surrender to Him? Today, in the name of Christ, I invite you to accept Him as Lord and Savior. If that's on your heart, and if this is a good day to make a public decision, would you come forward as we sing? Would you confess Christ, choose to be baptized, and maybe you just need a home church to walk with God? Please come. Make those kind of decisions are what you need to make.
to empowers us and gives us the strength to do his work until our days are done. And so say amen. 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 Uh, when you leave today in the bulletin, there was a little insert. Uh, next Sunday, we have a meal after church. Uh, Valerie Stowers, who's not able to be here today, uh, we uh, want you to see her a, a, a number on there. You can text her if you're going to be able to bring a side dish of salad or a dessert. Uh, another way you might do is if you leave, there is a basket uh, where you can drop that little insert uh, into the basket on the doors when you go out. And we would be sure she sees that if you want to circle what you could do and maybe write your name on. Uh, the giving of the church is great. We've got some projects going on. Um, one of the things, uh, we are going to be buying a church molar soon. Uh, if you can give a little bit more to help us get that done. We, we've got some uh, special things going on. And uh, we, we could use your giving this kind of year uh, for that kind of purpose. Father, use your church in a mighty way. Help us to be uh, faithful stewards of what you provide. May the fellowship be sweet. May the outreach be great. May we lift up your son. It is in your son's name I pray and most people say. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. I just want to recap a few things before we go. July 30th at 6 p.m., the 55 and older outing is at Los Patios in Mooresville. That's on Tuesday. Uh, we have a movie here at the church, which is Saturday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. The movie is The Blind. It's for the entire family. So come and join us for that. It's going to be a lot of wonderful uh, fellowship. Um, August 4th is Friend Day at the church. There will be a meal after the services. And again, if you can provide something, um, text or call Valerie Stowers today at 765-341-1015. August 8th is the Willie Robertson for creating a culture of evangelism, practical steps for effective outreach. Um, and that is Thursday, August 8th at 1 p.m. And the last thing is August 11th at 9 a.m. Um, is an outreach class led by Kevin Abel. And then 10 a.m. a guest speaker, which is our services next week, Jesse Pryor. Have a wonderful, blessed week. Put all this on your calendar. It's nothing but goodness. We're so blessed by your participation in this production. Um, we'd love it if you come and worship with us next week, shoulder to shoulder. But if you can't for any reason, please join us on Facebook Live. Have a wonderful, blessed week, and we will see you one way or another. We'll see you next Sunday.